weeks ago, um, our, our district superintendent um, came and shared what I assume will be his last message with us. He, he announced that he was heading to Colorado to accept a new challenge, and he spoke about faith, and he spoke about saying yes, and what that means, and what that implies. And I was... I took that message and there was parts of it that I that were just like, yes, 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 yes. And there was other parts of it I was like, ah, I don't know if I am applying, I'm, I'm not doing that, you know? So it was, it was a challenging thing. And, and so I stand before you this morning and will admit that even though I was raised in a Christian home, my, my parents met the Lord in the early 70s, my father is with us today, Jay Grinnell, it's awesome to have him here. I've been, listening, I've been listening to him preach for 40 years, um, and so it's an honor and a privilege to have him, but I grew up in a Christian household. I was taught from the time that I can remember to have faith in an unseen God. I was taught from a young age that this is the way we do things, and some of us are raising children in this time or have raised children, and we've taught them faith. you got to have faith. George Michael sang about it. <laughs> but that's not the faith I'm talking about. I'm talking about faith in Jesus Christ. And we're taught growing up in Christian homes or as you're new to the faith, you come in and we even call it the faith, right? But how many of us can admit that in the middle of that and in the middle of being able to say the right things at the right time and be able to know the scriptures and Hebrews 11, that's one that says, or excuse me, Hebrews um, one that say, 11, one that says, without... Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It goes on later in that chapter to say, without faith it's impossible to please God. Okay, I can quote those scriptures till I'm blue in the face, but what about on a Tuesday afternoon randomly when you're driving down the road and you say, I don't know if what I believe is really real. Has anybody been there? Can anybody be honest and say, I don't know if this is real. And so this morning I want to say to you that faith says. Last month was love does. This is faith. I thought it was pretty catchy. <laughs> Rachel was like, what, what are you doing? So turn with me this morning to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 12. I didn't know it was going to quite be this small. So this is just a test to see who brought their Bible to church this morning. <laughs> or your phone or whatever you're reading on. But it says... Starting in verse 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad, verse 6, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though we must endure many trials for a little while. Verse 7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested at fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love Him, though you have never seen Him. Though you do not see Him now, you trust Him. And you rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. Verse 11, they wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who have preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Amen? Amen. Awesome passage of scripture. But let's go back to that random Tuesday afternoon. What happens on that random Tuesday afternoon when the last thing you can possibly do is believe what that says? 
Can we be real? Rachel and I have been married for three years. Most of you know that we were both married before that. <gasps> that freaks some people out in church. Sorry. <laughs> After my last marriage, and I've shared a little bit about this, I never thought that, one, I would ever meet anybody again that would want to marry me, of all people. And then on top of that, I had three children, so, you know, who in the world is going to even talk to me? Well, Rachel was foolish enough to, <laughs> to do that. But in Rachel's first marriage, starting about 13, 14 years ago, they started to try have a child. Went through a miscarriage, went through in vitro fertilization, went through the shots, went through the stuff, spent thousands and thousands of dollars on trying to have a baby. Ended up resulting in three miscarriages. A lot of heartbreak, a lot of agony, a lot of pain, lots of people praying, lots of people saying, It's real easy for us to tell somebody else to have faith. So Rachel and I got married. We had already talked about the fact that we were ready to try to have what would be my fourth child, her first. And three months into our, four months into our marriage, she got pregnant. No fertility drugs, no IVF, just us being married and God's hand on our lives. And we both thought, yes, this is it. God, you are so good. And then just like the three times before, before she got through her sixth week, she lost the baby. Devastating. Shortly thereafter that, one of my good friends who, whether you believe in the prophetic or not, that's okay. You are where you are. I happen to believe that God still speaks through the power of the Holy Spirit and he uses men and women to do that. I have a friend that, that is a proven guy that hears from God. He has heard from God. He's spoken over people's lives. It's come to pass. The Lord has used this guy to do this, except that I know him really well. And so it's really hard when you know all the good and all the bad to receive something, especially when he's a close friend. And so after our miscarriage, in our pain and our brokenness, he came and he told my wife, whom he loves very much as well, Rachel, you will have a child and it will be a son. And then he was done. And then when Rachel wasn't around, I basically grabbed him by the shirt and said, what is your problem, man? <laughs> I was mad. What are you doing? He's like, I, Chip, I'm sorry. I know. I know. I know. I know. But I know what God said. I said, okay. A year later, we got pregnant again. Yes! God is faithful! The word is coming to pass. And not only are we pregnant, but I know we're having a son. We didn't make it through the six weeks. Lost another. Rachel came to me, heartbroken, a mess. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, I'm not straining. I'm not pushing. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not counting days. I'm not doing the ovulation schedule. We're not doing anything anymore. We're done. We'll adopt. We'll foster. We'll do something. Obviously, God's plan is different for us. And I said, okay, because the smallest amount of my pain pales in comparison to the mother, I believe, that's going through this. I don't know. I, I never have and never will lose a baby. I know that there's lots of women in this congregation that have. I don't know what that's like, but I, I could see what it was doing to her mentally, physically, and emotionally. And I was like, okay, we're done. 
Well, as I'm sure many of you know, Rachel is just wrapping up the 12th week of her pregnancy. And we got our genetic testing back on Monday. And I will tell you that the baby is perfectly normal, low risk in every category. And his name will be Samuel Parker Grinnell. Amen? He's coming in August. Okay? Chip said, this isn't going to happen. This will never work. This will never be. Faith says, we'll get to that in a minute. We went to buy a house. We put in an offer. The offer was accepted. Three days later, the banker called me and said, is this a church? I said, no, it's going to be a house. It was a church. He said, I can't help you. Three months, I tried to get financing for this place. Couldn't do it. Knocked on every door, every door closed. I was driving home from my buddy Joe's house one night, and I heard God say, I have this place for you. So in the middle of that, I came home and told Rachel, I think I actually, I don't know if I woke you up that night or I don't, I don't remember how I told you, but I said, you know, God said that we're going to have, we're going to get it. Well, another month went by and we lost our offer and had to say, we, we can't take the church, I'm sorry. I'd already gone to the elder board of the Free Methodist Church, stuck my neck out, felt like I was looking like a scam artist or a fool because I had made all these promises. We're going to get the money. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. It dissolved. A couple months after that, they called me back and said, hey, we haven't sold the property yet. We have another offer, but the denomination has decided to accept this for the property. Just so happened to be half of what our original offer was. And so through a couple of phone calls and my gracious mother and father, we were able to purchase that property with cash. But in that time frame, I would say, but God, you said to me that this was our place. And in that time, I would doubt and I would question. And those things would make me question, is, this, is any of this real? Has this been a sham my whole life? When I was a child, I had a reoccurring thought. And I've shared this with very few people, but I often thought that maybe I was in a coma and that I would wake up, particularly in my young teenage years, I thought about this a lot, that I would wake up and the life that I had just lived, you know, I'd be like seven or six and I hadn't actually lived the last seven years. And in that thought, I would think about like, what if my parents aren't really Christians? What if I just think they are? And so right there I would start questioning, and that was a pattern of questioning my faith. Is this really real? Do I believe that what I believe is really real? And so here we see Peter writing to the church in Asia and a couple other places. And he's explaining how our faith works. And first off, in verses 4 to 5, he talks about timeless faith. The question is not if we have faith. Everyone has faith. The atheist has faith that his rational reasoning has, reasoning has removed the possibility of God. He has faith in his intellectual ability. Others have faith in their ability, skills, connections, friends, family, themselves. Everyone has faith. The question is, where is your faith anchored? I've been walking around for, I don't know, probably 12 years now with a tattoo on my arm that says the anchor holds. You'd think I would have figured it out by now. <laughs> I was foolish enough to put it on my forearm. <laughs> you think that I believe it every day, but I don't. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being real. Because what happens? As we're walking through our Christian faith, the enemy comes and he whispers in our ear. And he makes this question. 
And he makes us doubt and he makes us wonder. We were studying in Triad these last couple weeks on sin. And it ties in perfectly with this because in Genesis 3, you want to turn there with me, Genesis 3, 1. Real quick, we'll go. In the New Living, it says, The man and woman sinned. The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild wild animals the Lord God had made. And we know that that is the enemy, Satan, Beelzebub, the one that was kicked out of heaven. Okay? We understand that that's him coming to the woman and whispering in in her ear. And one day he asked the woman. Now we know the story, right? They're in the Garden of Eden. Everything's good. Everything's perfect. There's no death. There's no sickness. There's no cancer. There's no waiting in line at stoplights. There's no orders wrong through the McDonald's drive-thru. There's no stubbing your toe on the way to the bathroom in the middle of the night. There's no crying kid at 3 a.m. There's there's none of that. It's perfect, right? They're in perfect fellowship with God all the time in, in communion with Him. Okay? But God had one thing to say to them. He said, you can do anything you want in this garden. You can eat anything. You can go anywhere. You can, you're, you're, but for one thing, you cannot eat of the fruit of this tree. And the enemy comes and says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And she says, of course we may eat from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you're not to eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. And he comes and he says, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. Did God really say? Chip, did God really say that I was going to give you that property? Did God really say that to you? I don't know. Did God say that to me? I don't Maybe he didn't say that to me. Maybe this whole thing, have I been, is everything... In the woods, after our second miscarriage, screaming at the top of my lungs. You want to be transparent? Scree- cursing God in the woods. God, you said. And now here's my wife at home, a miserable wreck. And my buddy said that we'd have a child and we'd have a son and it was going to be awesome. You said. God didn't say. Maybe this is all a sham. Maybe this isn't real. And so here I am, a quote unquote man of God, walking around, preaching, singing, being in public as a Christian person, and I'm completely doubting the absolute essence of everything that there is. I know that Jesus was a man. Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. It's written about in other historical fictional writings. Or non you know what I'm saying. Historical writings. You're with me. It's written about. Other faiths believe about it. You ask a Muslim, they'll tell you he was a great guy. He was an amazing teacher. They'll tell you that he was a prophet. But you know what they won't tell you? They won't tell you that he's the son of God, that he died for your sins on a tree so that today in 2019 you could live a victorious life. They won't tell you that because he's the only God that laid down his life willingly for us. And that's where our faith has to be anchored. And if we can't see past the end of our own nose and root our faith deep down in the trusting and saving knowledge that Jesus Christ died and rose again for your sins. Next week, just go to KT's for breakfast. Don't come. And that's easy to say. But the bottom line is, is that when our faith is tested, that's when the rubber meets the road. 
When you fall off the horse, if you don't get back on it, you're going to be scared of horses for the rest of your life. So when I'm in the woods screaming at God about how he's not God, guess what? Not only is he still God, not only is he still faithful in my faithlessness, but he still loves me. And as we heard Greg say, he still likes me. Tested faith. Our faith must be anchored in, time, in the timeless nature of Christ. But you can hear the questions being raised. How do you know that faith in Christ will hold up during the storms of life? Why should I trust Christ? Because this is no ordinary faith. It's a tested faith. Countless people have placed their faith in Christ and found that the anchor holds. Peter survived some incredible storms of life. And he says, here is what I found. The faith of Christ to be when it's put to the test. Peter found a tested faith valuable, revealing, and centered on love. We go to Hebrews and we see in Hebrews 11, and Rob touched on this when he's talking about you know, the faith of our forefathers. The faith of those that went before us. Noah. How'd you like to be Noah? Have you seen Evan Almighty? The modern interpretation. If you haven't seen that movie, it's great. It's absolutely great. <laughs> it's in modern times, and it, you know, he, he, it's it's Steve Carell, and he just it's it, he does it very well. I mean, it's probably blasphemous, but it's 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 a really cute movie. But God appears to him and says, "Build this boat." In modern times, and people, it's portrayed, I can only imagine what Noah went through. God said, Noah, build me a boat. You know what Noah heard while he was building the boat? Did God really say? It's in the first book of the Bible, chapter 3, right at the beginning. We see that the enemy comes and he says, did God really say? Is God real? What are you doing this for? The enemy has been doing it since the beginning. See, because before he got booted out of heaven, he was just like all the other angels. Rejoicing. Praising. In the presence of God. And then for whatever reason, maybe we'll know someday in eternity, I don't know, he decided, you know what, I want to be like God. I want to be like you. I want control. I want power. I want influence. I want people to know my name. I want people to respect me. I want people to know that I know more than they do. I want to be prettier. I want to be skinnier. I want to be taller. I want... Hello? And here we have the human condition. Why? Because he told Eve, did God really say? And so as we talked in Triad, it sent us on this course of death and decay. The knowledge of evil. See, they knew the knowledge of good. They had it made. They were perfect. And they said that after they ate that, that when God came into the garden, they hid themselves because they realized for the first time that they were naked. And they had shame. Because there was a division there. But see, as we go into this last piece, true faith In our postmodern world, we often hear the statement that what works for you may not work for me, man. And that's okay. Because coming from a Christian perspective of saying, I love you right where you are, that's a good statement. But saying it out of rebellion and saying, you know, 
we do whatever we want, whenever we want. We've got no moral compass, but that's when we start get. You see, everything can be either good or bad when you look at it in context. So in the postmodern world, what works for you may not work for me. But Peter had faith in Christ that was timeless. His faith was valuable, revealing, and full of love. But how does that mean what worked for Peter will work for me? Almost as if Peter anticipated your question, he writes about the faith of others. Prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament found their faith in God to hold. God spoke to the prophets and told them that the Messiah was coming. He gave them a hope that one who could deliver them was on the way. The message of the prophets can be summarized as hang on, God is working, the Messiah is coming, get ready, your deliverer is coming. Doesn't that sound like a message for people at the end of their rope? For people who don't know where to turn? It's a message of hope and encouragement. It's a promise. How many people do you know that need to be encouraged to not give up? How many people in this room need to be told that there's help on its way? Maybe you need to hear that God's promises are for you. That's the message of the Old Testament prophets. Peter points out that true faith is not only tied to the prophets, but also the fulfillment of those prophecies. There is a faith in suffering and crucifixion of Jesus. Faith in the suffering and crucifixion of Jesus. See, because... From the moment that Eve and Adam decided to eat of the fruit and their eyes were opened. <laughs> Creator God, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first from the last, the I am that I am. He had already created a plan. It was already in the works. And God said, I'm going to send my only son into the earth. To refute the enmity that is now between the woman and the serpent because of her decision and his decision to transgress and to separate themselves from me and to have their eyes open to the whole concept of evil, I will send my only son wrapped in human flesh and I will come and I will allow myself to be killed and martyred for your lives as a final atonement for every sin that's ever been committed is being committed and will be committed. How do you know that? Because unlike any other holy book, the prophets of old spoke of Him. And said, there is a Messiah coming. There is a Deliverer coming. So Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, was more than a man. He was more than a carpenter. He was more than a brother. He was more than a rabbi. He was more than a really eloquent dude on the street that was... He was the Son of God. And see, that's where Christians jump off and the Jewish faith stays where they are. Because they didn't see Jesus as the Messiah. They, they believed in Jesus. They, they, you talk to an Orthodox Jew. Jesus was the great prophet. But he wasn't the Messiah. But see, we know that he was the Messiah because of the testimonies of faith from the men and women in the early church. The ones that were there. Yeah, but how do we know that it's really real? It's just words. How do we know that it's really real, Chip? Look to your left. Look to the person to your right. The same way that men and women of old and men and women of the New Testament church understood that God was real is the same way that we can exercise faith today. Because you can look at your friend, your family, your brother, your sister, the person speaking to you on a random Sunday, and listen to them when they say, God spoke to me that we were going to have a son. 
God spoke to my friend that we were going to have a son. We had two miscarriages. All else had failed. There was no more hope we'd given up. And guess what? We haven't met him yet, but my son's in this room right now. That's faith. That's God. And that's God at work today in Countersport in 2019. Not because I'm special. Not because my wife's special. Not because we did something right. Not because we paid our tithe on time. Not because I said the right thing every time to the right person. Not because I had undoubting, unquivering, unshakable faith every minute of the day. No, it's because God's faithful. And faith says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when I don't... Amen. So the next time, the next time the devil whispers in your ear, did God say? You tell him. Yes, he did. The next time you get a report from the doctor that says you have cancer and there is no hope. Now, I'm not telling you that God's going to reach down from heaven. He can. I'm not saying it's going to happen and heal that situation. But when the enemy whispers in your ear, did God really say? I can tell you this. This life is but a whisper. This life is but a breath. This life is this big compared to eternity. And I can tell you that if you die of cancer tomorrow and you are saved and in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity with him and all the rest of us. So guess what? It may look like it's hopeless. It may look like it's the end of the line. It may look like, why God? Why would you do this? You can't be a faithful God. But I tell you this, it's not about right now. It's about then. Rob Douglas said it. But see, we get to be the embodiment of Christ on the earth right now. He taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I can tell you this, God does still heal, God will heal, and then when that happens, you got to shout it from the rooftops, because that right there is what faith is built on. That is what happens when faith is in action with men and women of God that says, God did this. Be vocal about your faith. Be vocal about what God's done for you. As Greg has said to me before, God moments, God sightings. What's God doing in your life? Rehearse them. Remember them. It doesn't have to be huge things. It doesn't have to be, we've waited for 13 years for a child. It doesn't have to be, I mean, to me that's a really big deal. Okay, to see God do this and to see what God's doing. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And I'm not speaking doubt, but if tomorrow something was to happen, guess what? If something was to happen, and Rachel and I have talked about this, and I never get to hold Samuel Parker, he's in there right now. And I, I'm scared every day. She's been through this five times, we don't know. The enemy comes to me every day. Did God really say? Did God really say? And my faith is shaken and I question and I doubt and I fall short but it, it, all in all the anchor holds the anchor holds just like the hymn goes the anchor holds made though the ship is tattered though you're beaten down though you're at the end of your rope Though you're miserable in your situation. Though it seems like you can't find a way out. Or maybe it's just everything's normal and everything's fine. And you're saying, God, I want to see God things happen in my life. The anchor holds. So in closing, faith says. Faith says, I'm a child of the king. Faith says, I'm an overcomer. Faith says, I'm the head and not the tail. Faith says, I'm above and not beneath. Faith says that when the world 
looks like it's upside down, backwards, sideways, and everything is completely spinning out of control. Faith says that God has it in control. Faith says that the Alpha and the Omega, the I am that I am, the God of the universe, the creative force that did it all, knows every hair on your head, knows every thought that you'll ever think, knows every word that you'll ever say, and knows every doubt that you'll ever speak over your own life. And guess what? He still died for you. He still loves you. He still likes you. So this week, as you go through your week, and the enemy comes and whispers in your ear, God say, put him in his place. Put him where he belongs. Because that same chapter, chapter 3 of Genesis, the Bible says that, that the woman will bruise the head of the, or crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bruise her heel. It talks about having child, pain in childbirth and all of the things, the symptoms of sin that come on and, 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 and that, that we will toil to, to bring seeds forth out of the ground and, and all those things. But guess what? There was already a way out. There was already a purpose and a plan. And so when he comes and says, did God really say, you say, Satan, get under my feet. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death, hell, and the grave. You have no power. You have no position. You have no authority to whisper in my ear. Because I can tell you this right now. If God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and at one day every knee shall bow, and the devil is under your feet, if he's whispering in your ear, that means he's a little too tall off the ground. If he can whisper in your ear, that means he's not under your feet. So this week, put him in his place. Faith says, faith says,